Good morning, folks. Um, <clears throat> would appreciate your prayers uh, today. We uh, we put in an offer uh, on a house, and we're waiting on a reply. And so uh, pray that that would come to pass. I tell you, y'all, houses are hard to come by around here. I mean, when a house comes available that you halfway like, it's like vultures coming in for the, the carcass, you know, and everybody's trying to get that carcass. And so I'm trying to get a carcass right now. I'm one of those vultures, <laughs> and uh, I ain't seen nothing like it. But, uh, but anyway, um, it, I was thinking earlier how... What Christians, we get to have a family reunion every single weekend. Y'all know that? And, uh, and that's what we do when we gather. We're gathering with family members. Uh, when you think of a family member, you think of somebody that's um, related to you by DNA in some fashion, some connection in that respect. But you and I, are brothers and sisters in the Lord according to his blood covenant that he made with us. And so we are related by blood spiritually, amen? amen. And, uh, and it's, it's so precious to be in the, in the family of God and to have people that you, that you love and meet with on a, on a weekly basis. Uh, please turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians in chapter 1. I began um, a study in Galatians, and, and I believe firmly that the Lord has led me here, because what you and I will find in this study of Galatians is uh, what it means to be a Christian. You know, and, and by and large, most people that identify with Christ they don't know what it means to be a Christian, believe it or not. Uh, how many of us have asked ourselves the question, are we truly saved? Have you ever asked yourself, uh, did I get the real deal? Well, in Galatians, uh, Paul is very uh, effective in letting them know that they can know that they are in Christ and that they are truly saved and, and lets them know what it means to be a Christian. And, uh, and by the way, after you and I get saved, we spend the rest of our lives figuring out just that, right? Figuring out what it means to be a Christian and all that thing and all those things associated with that. All right, well, let me get my eyeballs on here. I've got four eyes like so many of the rest of us, amen, and, uh, and it, just, it just goes with the territory. And uh, the entire epistle of Galatians, I've given the title, which deals with the tone and the theme of Galatians, and that is the gospel of grace. And that's what you and I will determine in learning from this book is that you and I are under the gospel of grace. Do you know that the majority of representations of Christianity in the world have a gospel of works? Not grace, works. And Paul, Paul, thank God for Paul. Again, Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. And you and I are now presently in what the Bible refers to as the time of the Gentiles. If you go back to Daniel, Daniel gives literally a, uh, an entire prophetic scene about the most, uh, uh, and specifically the history of the rise of these nations going throughout uh, that period, starting with Babylon, working all the way through human history, as it were, from that time on, dealing with particularly Israel as a people that are under God's eternal covenant, and also dealing with this new covenant that would come about by way of 
the church. So you and I are in what the Bible refers to as the time of the Gentiles. The church age is the big in gathering, if you will, of the whole wide world by way of the invitation of the cross. Amen? So you and I are under a time of grace. And heaven's doors are open and you and I are invited to this blessed salvation that we share together. If you have your Bibles open at Galatians, I hope I've given you plenty of time to... Put your DNA in your Bibles and get there. Please uh, look with me in verses 1 through 5, and I'll ask you to please stand at this moment in honor and reverence to the Word of God. Let's look at it together, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle, and then in parentheses, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all their brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God, and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the saints of God says, Amen. Let's pray. Father, bless this now, your message for your people and your time, and it's your will be done. So, Lord, may the anointing be upon the revelation of your word and the receiving of your word. May, Lord, you be high and lifted up as you say you shall draw all men unto yourself. So, Lord, we pray that the Spirit would speak, that you would be edif the church would be edified, and that you will be glorified in everything that is said and done. For we pray it in Jesus' name. And the church says... Amen. Please be seated. All right, a quick review. This message was not finished last week, so it's a continuation. But then it's also a little bit of an expounding on things that may have been missed along the way. Paul is giving a, a greeting here, a salutation. It is, and, and when he did that, it was typically all the same. It was, it was a blessing. And so remember that the Jews had a blessing that the priest would announce on the people of God, the covenant people of God. Well, you and I as the church, we have a blessing bestowed upon us, and that's what Paul would say every time he spoke to a church or to believers, he would give them a greeting of blessing. You and I are under the blessing of the Lord if, in fact, we are truly saved. And so he is the great apostle Paul. He is not of the original 11, adding Matthias the 12th. He was not of that original group. He was called differently, and he was called separately. And thank God he was called because his, Paul, his call was for a greater purpose and a greater reason than that you and I are bene beneficiaries of to this very day. So in speaking to these churches in Galatia, he is letting them know that he is a true apostle because many challenge his apostleship. Well, hey, you're not a, a, the original bunch that, that was with Jesus at the beginning. You know, who are you? And so... Paul had to literally defend his apostleship every step of the way in and through his ministry. And there are some things that are associated with his apostleship that verified the reality of his apostleship. And that is, he was authorized by the Lord. He was, of course, appointed by the Lord. And thirdly, 
he was anointed by the Lord. Now, an anointing is a significant word as it relates to his apostleship, which also translates over to the church as well. You and I as a church, as a body of believers, should have the anointing of God resting upon us. Do you know what the anointing of God? That means that you and I have the authority of God resting upon us. And the only way you and I can have the authority of God resting upon us is if we are in allegiance and obedience to the very word of God. Do y'all know that? You cannot be disobedient and rebellious against the word of God and have the anointing of God upon you. So if you are literally authorized under this anointing of God, then God will bless your church. It, is a, it, is, it literally deals with two factors. That is, you, you know that you are anointed church if you have faithfulness and fruitfulness. Well, there's no denying Paul's faithfulness, right? He was true to his Lord, the Lordship of Christ. He was a true servant of the Lord, stewardship of Christ. And he was obedient and he was faithful. There was no denying that. And listen, if anybody at that time dared to ask him about his faithfulness, all he had to do was take his shirt off and turn around and show him. Because he paid the cost of that calling on his life. He proved it time and time again. He was faithful. But you know what? He was also fruitful that his ministry bore fruit. It was spiritual fruit. Listen, church, if you stay true to the word of God and you're faithful to the word of God, you can't help but to grow and to bear fruit. Amen? It's just natural. I was telling one earlier about this plant. I bought my wife for her birthday last week. I got it at Publix. It was just in a little pot. It was about yay high, and it was starting to bulb. And just in just a couple of them was starting to branch out, and be, you know it bare that that flower. And uh, and and we were out of town back in Georgia for a few days. I mean, just a few days. And we came back yesterday, went in, and, and there it was sitting on the table, and that plant had literally, it had, re it had grown this much, I kid you not, and it was reaped, and it, and, and it was on the table, the flowers were on, just laying all over the table, and how it had grown. The same way it is, you and I, when we become believers, you will grow. You cannot hold it back. According to the very nature of the Spirit of God that comes in and resides within your heart, you will have a spiritual inclination that you never knew before. You will grow. And you will be what God has called you to be. As in the case of the Apostle Paul. Remember, it says that, he, it, that his calling was not of men. It was not a religion. Religion is of men. A works-based faith in religion is a man-made religion. As in the case of all of our denominations, they're typically man-made. And of course, he says it's not it's not of men. It did not come by man. It came by Jesus Christ. And you and I as believers, our faith came by way of Jesus Christ. You and I came by way of the cross. We came by way of the blood. We came by way of the glorious resurrection of our Lord. You and I came the same way in the same call and the same commission resides upon our life. So here we go. In, in like manner, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. 
And in John, the gospel of John in chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, it says, But as many as received him, that is Jesus, to them gave he power, that is authority or right, to, <clears throat> excuse me, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, verse 13, which were born not of blood. And it says also that it is, that it is, um, we were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh. It was not of your own desires. And then it says, nor the will of man. It is not man made, but rather it is of God. We are born of God. It is a new birth. And you and I have that, as in the case of the Apostle Paul. He gave great clarity to that. And then, over in 1 Peter, Peter speaks to this as well. And if you want to write this reference down, it can be found in 1 Peter in chapter 1. 1 Peter in chapter 1. And specifically in verse 23. It says there, being born again, Peter speaking, being born again, not of corruptible seed. It was not of the flesh. In Adam, you and I cannot be saved. You cannot. And that's what the Bible insists on, is that man cannot save himself. And other people cannot save other people. It has to be of God. And it says in that verse, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Jesus was the perfect, sufficient sacrifice for us. By the very word of God, the Bible tells us, which lives and abides forever. And so you and I are born according to the spirit of God by way of the word of God. It is an absolute phenomenal miracle that takes place. Now, it is important that he establishes his apostleship by way he can literally speak for the Lord. Now, the prophets spoke previously for the Lord. Now, for this, I want to go over another epistle. You can turn there if you'd like. It's just the next one over. In Ephesians in chapter 2 and verse 20. I'll, I'll start in verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And watch this in verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Remember the law and the prophets spoke forth the word of God leading to ultimately the salvation that you and I have. And it says that foundation, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the, uh, the prophets representing the Old Testament and the apostles set down the very foundation of our faith. And so it is important. Remember, the, the office of apostle or the apostleship expired at the death of John, the last living apostle, at around 100 A.D. And so... That, of course, their word was absolute truth as communicated from the Holy Spirit unto the church. And that was foundational to everything in the faith. And it goes on in Ephesians in chapter 4, and it says in verse 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we see here that the, uh, the prophets foretold 
the coming of the Messiah, and the apostles solidified that in their writings and in their teachings to the church. Very, from the very beginning even unto now. Now, you and I have our New Testaments, right? And in, that new te in our New Testaments, it is laid out accordingly. You have the first four Gospels, right? It is the Gospels of Jesus Christ. It tells the coming of the Messiah, the words of the Messiah concerning the kingdom. And remember, Jesus came primarily to speak to the Jews. He came into his own, and his own received him not. And so he laid literally the, the, the word of God the, concerning the kingdom of God that was presented right there at the beginning in the Gospels. Hey, next thing you know, what's after that? The book of Acts. Well, then you have the rise of the church there at Pentecost, remember? And the giving of the Holy Spirit. Listen, this had never happened. Prior to that, the Holy Spirit came and went. The Holy Spirit functioned according to its, its, uh, His work at that particular time in that particular dispensation. However, when Pentecost come along, everything changed. The Spirit, the Spirit descended and came upon the church, indwelling the church and anointing the church from their own. And it will be the case until the age of the church, the age of the, the present grace that you and I are in, it will continue until the rapture of the church. And then, my friends, everything will change after that. Right now, the salt has been spread upon the earth and the light has been dispensed upon the world. And if it were not for God's people dwelling on this planet, it would be an absolute, total darkness. And when I say darkness, I mean evil. It would be overrun. With, we're the only thing holding it back. And of course, that lets us know about Second Thessalonians, right? The restrainer, the one that's holding everything back? Well, eventually the restrainer along with the church will be removed and then the, then the world will go into a time of unprecedented evil. When I say unprecedented, I mean that according to what the Lord said, that the present time will be unlike any time in human history concerning the prevalence of evil in the world. It will literally, you talk about dystopian evil, it will permeate the world at that time. But right now, for the time you and I live in, which is temporal, we have a purpose for which God has called us. Paul had a purpose, and he hit the ground running from the time of his salvation, and he didn't let up. And that's the way it should be for you and I. When we get saved, we should hit the ground running and not give up and not give in as we live out our faith. And so we see here that Paul has let them know without a shadow of a doubt that he was called of the Lord. He gave his testimony many times. Very uh, unique testimony. He gave it over and over. And according to his faithfulness and according to his fruitfulness, the Lord bore witness with his faith. And then, of course, as he is writing, look in verse 2, it says, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Did y'all see that word churches? Now, in language that can be, of course, in that text, that means plural. That means local assemblies. Now listen, let me let me cast let me cast it out. I'm casting it out there for you, Kate, okay? I, I got that name right, right? I'm casting out now. Let, let me reel you in, okay? It's very, it's, it's very important that we get this. In understanding what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be in the faith, what it means to truly be saved, 
The local assembly, the local church, is the visual representation of what Christianity is and what Christianity does. It's very important. This is baptistic for all of our Baptists that are among us. This is very baptistic. And the doctrines that you believe and the doctrines that you, that you hold, they are closely associated with the, that demonstration of that faith in the context of the local church. What has happened in our time is we have turned ourselves toward the universal church in our belief and practice. In the universal church, it removes the accountability and responsibility of Christians in the faith. You can just go ahead and stay at home all you want to because, listen, I'm, a, I'm saved and I'm in the Lord's universal church. Are y'all following me so far? And so I don't have, I don't have to have those offices of the pastor and deacons, those are irrelevant. The ordinances, oh, we can treat the ordinances in, in, uh, in disrespect because, hey, we're a part of the universal church. No, 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 no. If you see, and remember, the epistles is giving, it comes after Acts. Acts is transitional. Do not build your doctrine in Acts. But the epistles are what lets us know the full doctrine of the church. And that is by way of the local church. Be careful with that. So many have turned the, uh, the church into the universal church and therefore removed the responsibility that is inherent with that demonstration of the church. You can actually, you can, you can, actually depart from the faith when you depart from the, your understanding and your faithfulness to the local church. Okay? One thing that you will get from me as, as your teacher, your pastor, I will most certainly indoctrinate you into the faith of Jesus Christ. You say, oh, that's a bad, bad term. Well, do you know that the world from the time of your birth begins to indoctrinate you into secular carnality? Right? Everything, everything about the world, the public school system on, is indoctrinate you into that fallen system that's corrupt by its very nature. And then when the Lord saves you, he brings you into an assembly so that he can re-doctrinate you or reprogram you or instill the spiritual word and the values of that word in your heart and do a complete change in you. That's what he does. And listen, remember, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Nor was a believer built up to the level of maturity and understanding in a day either. It literally takes the rest of your life to come to an understanding of who you are as a Christian. But my friends, do not neglect the local church. When, when COVID hit four years ago, it was an eye-opener to everyone concerned. Do you know that everything that has come into the world of late has divided the church? And that is dismantling the church? Do you know that the local church lost 40% of its membership as a result of COVID? And hell claps and heaven mourns. There should not be anything that stands in the way of a believer and their obedience to their Lord and their faithfulness to their Lord. I don't care what it is. Do you know going back to the Black, Black Plague, I believe it was, in the early 1800s, the church wasn't hiding at home during that plague. They were out and among the people ministering. 
Do y'all know that? You should. If, if, the, if, if any institution or any government or whatever tries to void out the assembly of the church, it is not of God. Be careful with that. They will try to shut you down any way they... Do you know that the church was literally considered a non-essential gathering? But hey, you could gather and you could literally riot and loot in downtown metropolis anywhere throughout America and the world. Oh, isn't that interesting? So you can show up in crowds and absolutely uh, uh, act like an idiot and be destructive, and that's okay, but you couldn't assemble in the church? It was ridiculous. California leading the way in ridiculousness. And so uh, there are some things that are, are facing the, the church churches going forward. And uh, whatever the world throws at the church, or whatever Satan throws at the church, we should stand up and we should stand fast and stand firm. And, um, and I tell you what, it will be costly. Do y'all know that uh, we as American churches, we don't know how to do secret church. Do y'all know what I mean by secret church? If the government ever, ever begins to persecute us and become hostile and enemies to us, uh, the church will be divided in the, um, which would be the government sanctioned church and the underground church, pretty much like it is chi in China right now. And what will happen is the true church will go underground because they're not letting anybody stand in their way of their worship and service to their master. Are you prepared to go underground? I remember when uh, all this COVID junk was going on, all those mandates and restrictions. We, of course, we kept having church and, uh, and we were meeting ag against the mandates and the ordinances that were set forth. And you know what? I, I was noticing, and by the way, it wasn't too many. I mean a handful, maybe a dozen. And I was noticing when they was pulling up in the parking lot, they were parking in the same places they parked all the time. And I thought, man, we need to be discreet about this. How about parking around back where nobody sees you? You just know what I'm saying? Use a little discretion for crying out loud. Once you start sneaking around where you can worship without hindrances or any of that stuff, you're going to have to exercise a little discretion. And listen, as far as American churches, if it ever comes our way, we will be learning as we go. I thought about, hey, we might need to uh, uh, bring in somebody at some point and, and let them do a little training on uh, how, how to practice underground church. How can we become a secret underground church? And you know what? I don't know how you could bring them in without exposing them. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We certainly couldn't have any cameras on them for crying out loud. But anyway, it's a real poss possibility. And, and Paul, Paul, of course, in the early church, they were dealing with their issues and, and, and listen, Paul was not alone in the ministry. He had people side by side with him. Uh, and and, and, and he, he, he literally instructed the churches uh, faithfully. Now, if you notice, the last part of this message is the acclamation of Paul, verses 3 through 5. Note this, verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot have the grace and peace of God unless you're saved. When he talks about this grace, let's talk about this. Y'all can write this down if you'd like. There, there are... 
there are two versions of God's grace. One is called common grace. Have y'all, y'all may have heard this before. Um, and so starting out new like I am, I don't take it for granted that you know anything. And if, and if I can introduce anything new to you, God bless you. Um, and so in um, Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to give you an example of common grace. And common grace is for all the creation of God. Everything under God's creation is under his common grace for his creation. It says in um, uh, verse 44, Matthew 5, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good, them, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. That's common grace. Listen, everybody is under, everybody, every creation of God, those that are even born under Adam are under God's common grace. Do you know that, that you can, as a lost person, in, in, in your desperation, you can cry out to God, oh God, heal me, help me. And you know God might just do that. And you can still die and perish. Do you know that when Jesus was doing his ministry and he went around and he, he, he most likely healed thousands. But you know what? It, everyone that he healed, he did not save. You can be under the common grace of God. That means that God is good and that God loves his creation, one and all, lost and saved. But it's just common grace. God will be gracious to you. God will even extend your life in the hopes that you will repent and be saved. Yes. Amen? Yes. That's God's grace. That's his goodness. That's common grace. But then here's another. And this grace applies to you and me. It applies to anyone who is in Christ. It is covenant grace. Covenant grace. And that, my friends, is a blood covenant. And listen, it is very important that believers know that when they are in Christ, it is a covenant and it is a blood covenant. It is an eternal covenant. It is an irreversible covenant. It is an irrevocable covenant. You are saved once and for all. And the reason why most people do not understand that reality is they do not know what salvation is. When you know what it is and you get your mind wrapped around that, you don't have to run around and try to work for it, and you don't have to jump through all of these religious hoops. You know that it is settled once and for all, and you couldn't lose it if you wanted to. Matter of fact, if we could lose our salvation, we would lose our salvation. If it was up to us, man, there wouldn't none of us get into heaven. Well, if you notice there concerning this covenant grace, it is a, it is a, it is, it is not like grace in, in the first one, common grace is, is in respect to God's creation. This covenant grace is applied to God's children. People say, well, everybody, everybody that's born into the world is a child of God. No, they are not. This fatherhood of God, it is not so. The only way that you can become a child of God is to be born again. How, how do people become children? They have to be born, right? right? They have to come out of that curse. Remember. 
Before one is saved, they are under the curse. They are condemned in their sin and their trespasses. And they are blind. And then they are dead as well. And they are without hope. Matter of fact, the Bible says that they are the enemies of God. Try to get your mind wrapped around that. But when you get saved, you become a friend of God. That's called reconciliation. It's amazing. You take all of, of the theological terms related to being saved, and every single one of them disputes the reality of losing one's salvation. How can you be unadopted? How can you be unatoned for? How can you be unregenerated? You think about that. Every single one of them they speak to are... Eternal security. Y'all know I believe in eternal security, right? Amen. Amen. Uh, by the way, that is, uh, that is very, very Baptistic as well. And so um, this, of course, speaks of our acceptance through Christ. We have an advocate with the Father. He is our, he is our mediator. In the blood covenant, he is our intercessor. He intercedes on our behalf in the person of the Holy Spirit. And you, I, you and I are, of course, under the priesthood of the believer. And thus, we have direct access to the Father. My friend, that's astonishing. I don't know about you. I can't get my mind wrapped around that fully. It's absolutely amazing. So we, of course, are, we are the children of God according to that covenant grace. Now I'm going to read a scripture for you. You can write this reference down if you would like. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and um, in verse uh, 36. It says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So you and I, and, and that's one thing that Paul's going to get across to these churches in Galatia, is that they, are, they have been liberated from the bondage that you, they once were under. And the bondage and the condemnation condem the condemnation associated with sin is an impossibility to be released without the aid of God. Do you all know that the, the Exodus um, um, event parallels the Christian conversion experience? Did you all know that? One thing that was true, under that bondage that they found themselves in, it was impossible in and of their own power and means to be released from slavery, from that bondage. And remember, Pharaoh is the, the symbol of Satan. He's represented by Satan there. Uh, a, a Satan will not release his, those that are in that bondage, of course, without the power of God intervening. And, of course, their deliverance was only ultimately accomplished by the final plague or curse that came upon Egypt, which led to their delivery, was the blood. Isn't that fascinating? Absolutely wonderful. Well, I want you to see in verses 4 and 5, um, not, not to sort of dismiss this piece, this, this piece is literally speaks of reconciliation with God. Okay. Now moving from that to we have atonement through Christ, verse 4 and 5, it says, who gave himself for our sins. The first part of this atonement is that God the Father saves us in Christ. 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. You and I have to be forgiven. And that only comes by way of the shedding of blood, which brings forth our forgiveness. Paul points out the fact that Jesus gave himself for our sins. His life was not taken from him. His life was offered for us. Amen? Amen. And so he gave his life freely. It was a sacrifice. And by the way, it, by the way, it was a sufficient sacrifice. It was sufficient. So God the Father saves us in Christ, and, and, and it continues in verse 4. God the Father sanctifies us in Christ. Look with me in verse 4 again. It says that he gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. This goes beyond regeneration to sanctification. That the very power of God that brings about our conversion also brings about our consecration. You do know that you and I are consecrated vessels unto God. And consecration means to be set apart as holy. When God saves us, we become his consecrated vessels and from that new birth on God does a good work and a new work within us so it speaks of our sanctification he literally has the power to deliver us I want you to think about the model prayer Jesus gave the model prayer to his disciples by extension to us and one of the things about the model prayer is we're to pray daily deliver us from evil why should we pray that daily because we're under the sanctifying power of God whereby we pull away from evil pull away from those distractions and continue in the faith daily and the model prayer is a daily prayer, and your faith in Jesus is a daily walk. It is a marathon, not a sprint. And so he literally sanctifies us. And um, I want to turn to Hebrews at this point. Look with me in Hebrews in chapter 2. Hebrews in chapter 2. And uh, in... And specifically uh, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Death has no authority or power over anybody that's in, in Christ. You might expire in this world bodily, but make no mistake, my friend, if you are in Christ, well, you will continue spiritually, eternally with the Lord. Amen? You know, we was talking earlier about our weekly reunions as believers. You know that this is preparatory for heaven. We gather now, we assemble together, and when you and I leave this world, we're going to be gathered and assembled before the throne of God. Did y'all know that? It's interesting that oftentimes I, I say this, that you know why, you know why church folks sit on the back row, not picking on anybody in the back row, by the way, but you know why, you know, church members will typically sit on the back row because there's no seats in the parking lot. <laughs> but let me ask, let me tell you this, though. When you and I get in heaven, I'm not going to be wanting to sit to be. To, we're not going to be sitting, by the way. We'll be standing. 
will stand in the presence of God. You say, well, I'll get tired and tuckered out. No, you won't. But as you and I are standing in worship, I don't want to be standing on the back row. I want to be standing on the front row. I want to be as close to the glory of God as I can get. Amen. And that's where you and I will one day be. You know, we gather week in and week out because it's a rehearsal for going over there. What we practice here, practice, 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 we will execute over there. Oh, it's interesting what Jesus said in John in um, the, the Gospel of John and uh, in chapter 16. John chapter 16, um, if I can get to it. Uh, the Gospel of John in chapter 16 and uh, verse 33. This will be a familiar scripture to you. In John 16, 33, it says this. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. There we go back to that word peace. You're not going to have peace apart, apart from being in Christ. Christ is the one that gives that peace. That peace that passes all understanding. And so it says, these things I have spoken unto you that in me, and that's of course the things he's speaking is the word of God, in the word of God we have peace. So these things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace, in the world ye shall have tribulation. This world should be very uncomfortable for believers. I've always said this jokingly, when, uh, when the rapture occurs, a lot of Christians will be raptured upside down. Y'all know what I mean by that? Because they'll be clawing and trying to hold on to the world going up. So they'll go up feet first. Ha, you get that? No, man, I want to go up hands first. I want to be like this. I'm ready. I am ready. And that's how we should anticipate. We should be uncomfortable in this world. We should be like fish out of water. We should be absolutely disgusted with the prevalence of evil. And listen, my friends, as we get closer to the tribulation, the church will get further away from God by way of apostasy. They will apostate and they will flee from God. The world will descend ever closer to darkness leading up to our departure. Don't think there is going to be some utopian revival prior to the Lord's coming. No way. We're not going to usher in the kingdom. Jesus is going to usher in the kingdom. Okay? And so uh, things, uh, things about this world, there will be tribulation. Jesus said, and this is a promise, in the world you will have tribulation that destroys the health, wealth, uh, name it and claim it, prosperity gospel, does it not? In the world, you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. You will have difficulty. You will have sicknesses. By the way, Christians are not exempt to troubles and tribulations of this world, are we? Your aches and your pain is just like those who are lost. Your concerns and your anxieties are just like those who are lost. But you have an advantage that they don't have. You have God as the center of your hope, the center of your being, and your life. Amen? And so it says in that, in that scripture, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus paved the path. He went before us. He showed us the way. And made no mistake, no matter what befalls us in this world, if you got Jesus, then you have everything that you need to get through. So God the Father sanctifies us in Christ. And then lastly, God the Father secures us in Christ. Look in verse 4. He might deliver us from this present evil world. Watch this. According to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Two things are mentioned there. 
the will of God and the glory of God. You and I are absolutely secure in Christ because it's the will of God. Some people say, hey, there is the perfect will of God and there is the permissive will of God. Have y'all heard that? Getting a little theological here. Well, God doesn't have a, uh, an escape clause. He doesn't have a contingency plan. He has a plan. Right? And listen, we're not fatalistic robots marching along as God dictates and determines. No, 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 no. It's just that in the mind of God, in the wisdom of God, in the knowledge of God, in Him being omnipresent, that is past, present, and future, omniscient, that is past, present, and future, He knows all things past, present, and future. He just happens to know what's going to take place. We don't know. We're living out our lives, right? But he knows because he's God. If we had God sitting up there and he was just operating by the the seat of his britches and he was, uh, 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 well, plan A don't work out. We'll have to turn to plan B for crying out loud. Boy, I wish that would have happened differently. God's not like that. And you know what? It would be very healthy for each and every one of us concerning our own faith and our own concerns about life to understand that we belong to a supreme and sovereign God Almighty. Amen? That's comforting. The will of God... uh, uh, The will of God doesn't fluctuate. If you notice in your bulletin, I'm preaching the bulletin this morning, right? God the same. What? Yesterday. And what? Today. And forever. Isn't it interesting in the Christian mind, we think God's will fluctuates, right? Oops, we made a mistake. God changed his mind. (laughs) You know, it's like, um, let me just sort of explain this really quickly. You say, you believe that the Lord can come at any, in any moment and any second, don't you, preacher? Yes. And you say, well, at the same time, preacher, you're trying to buy a, a house and get into a 30-year mortgage, right, preacher? Yes. <laughs> That's how it works, y'all. You live your life that you have and that you know now. But you also anticipate what God will do. I have no doubt whatsoever, and I hope you don't, that the Lord said he who comes and what the Lord says he means. And I am assured as he came the first time, he will come again. But yet we have to live our lives, right? You say, great preacher, you give me permission to go out and buy a new car. Go on about yourself. Live your life to the glory of God, but make no mistake, he is coming. And this also communicates something concerning the will of God. It is my belief that God sent me to this church for this time and this hour and in this particular day in which we live. That's the will of God. That's why I'm confident about buying a house. And you know what? In a Baptist church, a typical Baptist church, that's, pre- that's pretty touchy territory. Because you could push somebody's button, cross somebody's red line, and the next thing you know, it absolutely will blow up in front of your face. Listen, my friends, in a Baptist church, you might have two people, but you'll have three opinions. (laughs) And a Baptist church is like herding cats. Y'all ever tried to herd cats? 
But you know what? It's the will of God. It's amazing how churches, they'll say, Oh, this is the will of God that we do this. And I tell you, the, it ain't no time and they're done backtracking. Remember, God's will doesn't fluctuate with our feelings and it doesn't fluctuate with our opinions. God's will is absolute. And it goes along with his word. His word is absolute. Amen. So as we enter into this time of invitation, isn't it good to know that God's in control and we're not? With our song leaders and companies, please come. We're going to have an invitation. And, you know, you might be struggling with your faith and you might be out of sorts and you might be very concerned about things. And you just need encouragement. Listen, that's why the church gathers is so we can bear one another's burdens as well. That we can hold one another up. That we can encourage one another. Well, you may need to come and get some encouragement. You may need to come and get some counsel. Um, but listen, be open to what God has to say. Don't never approach God and with a predetermined outcome of your situation, don't do that. You have to be open to the leadership of the Lord. If you're here this morning and you're not saved and you're not secure in your faith, you need to make that right. Do you know that a lot of people are accepting a, um, a religion, but they're not accepting Jesus and there are a lot of people that have discovered, even later on in life, hey, I didn't really get saved. There's no fruit. There's no evidence. And man, they're coming and they're making that right. They're settling that. Uh, and listen, a, a way to put that is, if you have a hope so salvation, my friend, you're in trouble. If you're hoping that you will go to heaven when you die, you're in trouble right now. You need to know so. K-N-O-W, know so without a shadow of a doubt. You say there's no way that you can know that. Oh, yes, there is. The Bible assures, assures us. That our spirit will bear witness with the Holy Spirit that we are the children of God. Romans. Make that right. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings upon this invitation. We pray the guidance of the Spirit in each and every heart, each and every need. May you, Lord, bless this church, this time, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.